if someone were to walk up to you and want to know what your personal why is, how would you answer that? It's family. That's the most important thing. Welcome to Eco Ask Why, a podcast that dives into industrial manufacturing topics and spotlights the heroes that keep America running. I'm your host, Chris Granger, and on this podcast, we do not cover the latest features and benefits on products that come to market. Instead, we focus on advice and insight from the top minds of industry because people and ideas will be how America remains number one in manufacturing in the world. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode. We're going to be talking with Mike Kasha, who is a product manager at Electrical Equipment. How you doing, Mike? I'm doing fine, thanks. Good, buddy. It's uh, been a good day here in Eco Ask Why Studio. Enjoying getting a chance to talk to you. Look forward to this conversation for our listeners. So, Mike, we typically kick these off, buddy, just by giving our listeners a little bit of your history about your personal journey. So, what can you tell us? I'm feeling old when you ask me that question. I've been in manufacturing, industrial manufacturing, for about 35 years now. I got my start, believe it or not, I was in college taking electronics and things like that. And I got my start engraving legend plates at a panel shop. And, you know, that had nothing to do with electricity, but it got me next to somebody who was working with electricity. And I thought that was a a good move. And it, it turned out it was. So it was at a control panel shop. I worked there for a couple of years designing, building custom control panels. I moved my my way up from engraving and and, uh, got the hands-on experience, which I'll never uh, trade for anything. And then later I went and worked in manufacturing at an end user, carpenter company. They manufactured urethane foam. Uh, They had about, I don't know, 10, 13 plants in the U.S. and plants in England, Germany, and France. And in about eight years, I got about 16 years experience because I was in a corporate engineering department and we did everything, drawings, uh, PLC code, HMI, drives. I ran the contractors, solicited for quotes. I ran the startups and then had to live with the equipment after you deployed it. Then you got the calls from the plant saying, hey, this thing's not working. Come help me or whatever. And uh, even saw some of the uh, machines get upgraded over that time as well. And then after that, I went to work for Siemens, one of the larger global uh, electrical automation companies in the world. And there I did everything from senior application engineering and uh, work in the tobacco industry and the semiconductor industry. And then I specialized in automation for about 10 years. And then I also uh, did a tour in the drives business unit, supporting everything from fractional up to a megawatt of, of drive technology. And then after that, I went to go work for an electrical equipment company and uh, enjoying things in, on this side of the fence for about seven or eight months now. Okay. Very cool, man. So, I mean, 35 years. So what you start in, in, in manufacturing, what, first, second grade, something like that? <laughs> so I, yeah, I'd like to that. <laughs> I hear you. I hear you, man. Where'd you go to school at? Uh, I went to Old Dominion University in uh, Norfolk, Virginia, not too far from home. I call home Mechanicsville, Virginia. Go and Monarchs, I got- man. I, I went to ODU myself, so uh, you're, in, you're in good company, my friend. <laughs> it's a great school. We got a lot of practical education there, uh, and it didn't hurt to be close to the beach at the time either. <laughs> yeah, that was definitely a perk, I must say. There, there are several perks at ODU. We can't get in all that here because we don't want to get fired, Mike, but it was uh, <laughs> good stuff. ODU is a great campus, great college, so... Uh, I was just curious on that, and I mean, it sounds like you had some wonderful experiences from learning hands-on to uh, working for Siemens and now, you know, working here at Eco. So it just sounds like you really enjoyed your journey, buddy. That's a good way to call it, a journey. Uh, It's a lot of experience, different kinds along the way, and it's amazing. You really remember a lot along the way, and you build on your knowledge. It really is. When I look back on the memories of what I've done, I've really enjoyed what I've done. Right. Uh, I wouldn't do it for anything. No doubt. And I know you, in your current role, you're supporting the industrial end users. You have a lot of history with that uh, in the past as well. So what are you seeing? If you had that crystal ball and you could make that call for the the end users out there, what do you think's coming on the horizon? Any challenges that they need to be aware of? Uh, The biggest challenge by far, I hear it everywhere, is skilled labor. The factories the machine builders, the distributors of technology, the vendors like Rockwell and Siemens, everyone is struggling to compete to secure the adequate skilled labor 
for all positions, not just technical ones. For operators, for warehouse workers, everywhere you look, there's skilled labor challenges. And I emphasize skill, too, because in the U.S., let's face it, a lot of the industries that were not automated, that were very manual, those industries have already left the U.S. years ago. And what we're left with now is more of the higher tech industries. And as such, we have to compete. And in order to compete, we got to use the skilled labor force that we have to the maximum capability we can. And that means we need to really look at our efficiency of our plants. We need to run smart and advanced manufacturing. And in order to do that, we got to leverage the latest state-of-the-art technologies out there. And having said that, if we accomplish this, which I think we are, I think we're very successful competing on a global scale. But as we create that expert best-in-class manufacturing capability, we got to lock that down because there's lots of countries out there that would like to steal our ability to manufacture efficiently. So what I'm talking about is intellectual property. And one of the biggest challenges to locking down the intellectual property is not allowing hackers to come in, you know, through our firewalls and copy our recipes, copy the way we manufacture, copy our designs. That's a big challenge. And I know the federal government's been funding special programs in universities across the U.S. for the countermeasures to cybersecurity. So cybersecurity, advancement in, in automation are two things that need to go hand in glove uh, because if, if we can go back to the plant architecture in, in an automation uh, mindset, you take the OT and the IT, the OT being the operation environment and, and the IT being the information environment of the plant. We're talking about in, in smart manufacturing industry 4.0, bringing those two networks together, which means connecting them on Ethernet, which means that now all of a sudden now we're potentially making our production vulnerable to cyber attacks. So we can't connect the two together and advance our efficiencies without locking them down and securing them so that we don't give up the farm, so to speak. No doubt, man. This is We're hearing that more and more with the more people we talk to on, on EcoSY as well, that ITOT convergence and the doors that opens from a cybersecurity standpoint. And I do want to go back to your first point, just the skilled labor gap. It's real. Absolutely. Some salient points that you recognized, uh, my friend, for our listeners, they're all tough topics, but uh, having conversations like this and then being able to, to work together, I think it's things we can't overcome. So, you know, Mike, if, if somebody was out there and they want to pursue a career in industry or pursue a, a product manager type role, any advice you'd like to offer up to them right now? Sure. I mean, I reflect back when I was in school and it, it was a dream to become a technical resource, an engineer in the market. My background is electrical engineering. And, you know, I called myself that before I graduated. And that was my thought. And, I, you know, when I graduated, it was a personal goal of mine to actually do the work that I was educated to do. Some people get a degree in one thing and then they do something else. And that's fine. But in my view, I went to school to be an engineer and I wanted to be one. And when I got out, I, I really thought that I was trained to do everything. You know, I thought I was supposed to be able to graduate and go to a place to work and they would hand me a project and I would start designing it. But what I realized looking back, though, and I'd like to share that with everybody out there, is what college or let's say technical trade schools teach you, it's not so important the actual content that they're teaching you. It's more important that you are learning how to learn, because let me tell you something, in 35 years, I have never stopped learning, and it's the ability to learn quickly whatever technology that your customer or your employer needs, the ability to learn whatever they need and putting it to work. That's the value you bring to the table with your education. No doubt. You're all over it. When you stop learning, you're done, and you have to have that's that mentality, man. That's it. That's great stuff. That is great advice, and we stand with you on that one for sure. So from a learning standpoint, what are some resources that you typically go to or that you use to grow in the past? Well, uh, mentors are really good. I'm a strong believer that surrounding yourself with people that are smarter than you is a really good thing to do because you've heard the analogy that the intelligence might rub off on you, and it's true. You surround yourself with people that really know their stuff, and you're going to learn a lot. Some people get intimidated. They want to be the smartest guy in the room or whatever. 
But when you do that, you're limiting your exposure to learn more. So I really uh, encourage people to try to, you know, surround yourself with people that are best in class or smart in their field and don't limit yourself to one discipline. Everyone has something to teach you along the way, whether they be mechanical, civil, process engineers, or even production people. They all have things to teach you. Just keep your brain and your mind open to what everybody has to teach you along your way. Now, you're stealing my thunder, Mike, because I mean, surrounding yourself with people smarter than you, this is is on my business card, I think. It's kind of what I do, brother. So uh, maybe there's some listeners out there that can appreciate that. But you're right. One thing, Put your ego down and be okay that somebody may know something that you don't know. And that's okay. There's an opportunity to learn and improve yourself. And you probably have things you can offer them too. You're all over. You don't let the ego, your ego get in the way, but to just be willing to surround yourself with better, smarter, and just learn and absorb. So good stuff, man. Now you've mentioned mentors. Any mentors jump out that you'd like to give a uh, shout out or recognition to today? Well, my first mentor was a, a gentleman by the name of uh, Buddy Klotz, and he owned an electrical control panel shop. You know, I mentioned that I worked there. He saw something in me that I didn't see in myself. He was a big time encourager. He knew me before I graduated from college, and he always just uh, had so much confidence in me and thought that I was really going to be something someday and I was going to get that engineering degree. And he always offered me work when I wasn't in school. He always gave me part-time work when, during the holidays and during the summers when I had off. And he actually offered me my first job out of college. I guess I was lacking a little confidence when I first started. And he gave me that confidence. And he actually gave me my first project out of uh, college and threw me to the wolves on a very large upgrade of a machine. And I was struggling. I'm trying to get the drawings right, trying to do everything perfect. I think that my commissioning startup on the machine was like two weeks long. And I thought I was a complete failure because it didn't, you know, I just didn't throw the power on, check a few things out. And the thing just didn't come up and run perfect. Turns out two weeks was like a crazy short startup time compared to what most people had done in the past. I just didn't have the right expectation of myself and, you know, and what it takes to commission a new machine. (laughs) <laughs> so, you know, I look back and Buddy, he really encouraged me the whole time and told me, you're doing a good job and don't worry about it. Just keep plowing forward. And when I didn't know something, he would help me. And I, I hope everyone can find that first mentor for them to help them over the hump. Absolutely. I mean, have you had a chance throughout your career, Mike, to be that mentor to someone at this point? I have, and it, there's a lot of young bucks coming in. And as I've gone along the way, I've mentored several people, and it's a real satisfying thing. And, and I share all the, the things we're talking about right now. That's what I share with them as well. As long as you have a good work ethic, you show up for time on work, and you do due diligence, you study things, you're alert. When you're taking training class, ask questions. Don't sit there and be afraid to ask questions, even if they're stupid ones. There's no stupid question. If you don't know the answer, it's you need to ask the question. What's stupid is not asking the question. So <laughs> just like I said, just keep learning and, and take every opportunity to the maximum. No doubt. And I mean, thank you for taking the time to pour into others. It's so important as we grow and as a community, particularly within manufacturing and engineering, to support each other and help lift each other up. And so anytime that I hear about people offering mentorship, it's just, it's great things to talk about it may spark someone's mind right now if they're listening to the podcast uh, you know what i need to be more intentional about mentoring others because a lot of it just comes down to being intentional just make it a priority so you know hats off to you for doing that man that, that's great stuff i think it's really fun to teach others and if i retire you know a little early and still have some some uh, time in the day, I'd really love to go back to like a technical trade school or back to high schools and go back and teach math or something because I never forget in, in geometry class in high school, you're learning all these opposite angles and theorems and all these things. And I, I remember asking the teacher the question, what is this used for? And the teacher didn't know the answer at all. And it was so discouraging at the time. I just kept plowing through in math because I was good at it. I I had no idea I was going to become an engineer. But if I could go back in time and be that teacher so that when they ask the question, why do I need to know the equation of a line? And I could easily explain to them when I was in the chemical industry, we used the equation of a line to come up with the flow chart for a positive displacement pump. 
we use linear regression. There's a use for all this math and us engineers, you know, some of us that don't have family that are already in the field and passing it down like me. I didn't have any family members that were engineers and showed me the roadmap. I was figuring it out as I went along. But for those people who have the math capability and don't know what to do with it, it sure would be nice to have someone that can share with the young folks where the math is going and what it's used for that it really does have practical uses. Yeah, no doubt. I mean, it ties it all together, right? Absolutely. Good stuff, man. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. And when you think about engineering, a lot of people have certain uh, preconceptions about what engineers are or what they do. Um, Anything that you've found throughout your career that doesn't align with what people think of when they think of engineers? Yeah, I, I don't know that I can pinpoint a good answer for that one, but I can tell you when you're in social circles and you're in a general audience or whatever, you want to stop a conversation real quick. Normally, it's when you introduce yourself as an engineer, it stops the conversation right there. <laughs> What's funny, a, a lot of engineers that that I, I think there's a tendency to this. I'll tell you a little story on myself. In the 11th grade, my English teacher told my dad, without me in the room, told me that I wasn't bound for college. I wasn't supposed to go to college because I I almost failed English. And my dad told her, don't tell my son that. And I didn't learn that till years later. It turned out I went to engineering school and got a college degree. And I've been doing this stuff ever since then. And what I figured out was a lot of engineers, you know, we have weaknesses. Some engineers have it all. They're musical, they're technical, they know math, they know history, they know everything. That's they're really smart guys out there. Me, I, I was strong in math. I had ADD and I was weak in English and I hated English. Didn't like to read it, didn't like to write it. And that's why this teacher said I wasn't bound for college. But the key thing is when I got to engineering school, it was so funny. When you look around at all your buddies that are engineering school, you're like, oh my gosh, they're all like me. Most of us had ADD, weak in English, strong in math. It, it was just hilarious when you get in a room full of technical folks, you find, oh, there's all the guys that are just like me. I don't feel so abnormal anymore. You found your people, right? <laughs> Very good. It takes all types to make the world go around. No doubt, man. No doubt. Thank you for sharing that and being open with our listeners. Don't let people put limitations on yourself. And if you're determined to do something and you have the right work ethic and drive, you can get it done. So hats off to you, buddy. That's right. Last work question, then we'll get off work. So what do you enjoy doing the most, man? When you're the happiest in your career, what are you doing in those moments? I love solving problems. Give me a challenge and go scratch your head and design something and then commission it and see it to reality. That's really satisfying. It really is to to make improvements in, you know, on machines. And, and oftentimes you're in production you have operators who they're living a hard life on a machine because it could be physically challenging or it could be frustrating because they're not able to produce the quality of product that they'd like. And then you come in there and, and offer them a new way to do things with a, a, a higher automated machine. And I've seen operators have smiles on their face as a result of the work that we us, us engineers, the, the type of work that we do. And I've seen that smile on operators. And when you're able to go back to the corporate office and do another machine or, or another design, they're still on that same machine day in and day out. And that's their life 40 hours a week. And you just improved it. So that's really satisfying right there. Very good, buddy. I mean, you know, you're know, you all over it and no doubt that you find that, that satisfaction a lot in what you do. So, you know, let's get out of work for a little while. And let's put on our, our non-eco, non-career hats and talk a little bit outside. So any hobbies, anything you enjoy doing for fun? I'm not good at it, but I do enjoy golf. I haven't had enough time to really hit enough of it, but I enjoy golf. I also have a, a fishing boat and I like to go fishing. I haven't done much yet, but I plan to do a lot more. But the most important thing to me is my family, my wife and my two daughters. And uh, recently, just uh, we just added a grandson to our family. And there's nothing more important than family and relationships. Let me tell you, friends and family is the most important thing I think we all bring with us. No doubt. Now, is this your uh, first grandchild? First one. Yes, sir. Okay. And he says a boy. Yep, his name is Miles. Miles. All right. So is is Miles, does he live close to you? He does. He's only 30 minutes from the house. So there's a pretty high probability of Miles is going to get spoiled by Grandpa, huh? A, a little bit, yeah. <laughs> now, what, now, what do you prefer to be called? Everybody has a different name. What, what, what do y'all want him to call you? Call oh, me? Yeah, is it oh. Grandpa, Papa, or what? Papa, yep, that's it. 
Okay. Okay. That was it. <laughs> nice, man. I remember having a conversation with my dad after my first daughter was born. It was about three or four months after she was born, and and he walked in the room, and I said, I don't know who you are or what you've done with my father, but I'd like to see, I'd like to have him back at some point to talk to him because he completely transformed, right, from dad to granddad. So have you had that it's, moment yet? Yeah, yeah. You get, a, you get a redo, man. It's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, hey, man, that's great. Sounds like you got a wonderful family, a lot of fun hobbies you get to do. Maybe you'll get to take Miles out on that boat and do some fishing. And uh, Yep, that's you know. the plan. That is awesome. That is so cool, buddy. What about other things like books, podcasts, uh, resources, things that you enjoy that you would like to, to recommend for our listeners out there? That And it could be personal stuff or it could be business related. Just didn't know, is there, is there anything you consume that you find a lot of value in that you would like to share with our listeners? Well, I can't say that I know of anything unique that your listeners probably don't already know about. I mean, I can tell you that Everything it needs fixing around my house and my family's always expected me to take a whack at fixing it. And I've tried my best, but in the last couple of years, oh my gosh, YouTube is your friend. And it translates to the fact where we just got to figure out how to get how to videos and how to information on a mobile device in a plant that's going to translate. But yeah, YouTube, everything that's, that's, that's the biggest thing that helps me at the house technologically you know our houses are all going smart this for security reasons for convenience reasons I, I think everything's going cloud but again there's a similar uh scenario that we've been talking about the plant it, it applies to your house because guess what bad people want to get on that network too so word of caution i think we all need to think about cyber security on our houses especially when you think about cameras and things like that but anyway yeah no doubt buddy no doubt Mike, this has been just a fun conversation. We've learned a lot about you. We always wrap up Eco Ask Why with the why, where we get down to the purpose and understanding what's important, what makes you tick, what drives you. So if someone were to walk up to you and want to know what your personal why is, how would you answer that? It's family. That's the most important thing to me. It's my wife and my daughters and my church. And, you know, and I'm a Christian, so that's that's my faith is really important to me. There you go, my friend. With nothing wrong with that. Great answer. It sounds like you are you have your roots planted in good soil, and that is awesome. So we're we're happy that you took the time with us on Eco Ask Why to share your story, Mike. I know it will inspire others, and hopefully, someone out there they're listening. They picked up on some of this great wisdom and insight that you provided. So, thank you for taking the time with us today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com.